Morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone online. It's great to be with you again and sharing with you this morning. Uh, and before I do that, uh, and before we have a think about this topic of self-acceptance and unpacking uh, some of those words from uh, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, I'm going to pray for us. So, Father, as we look at this challenging topic of self-acceptance, we thank you that your word has so much to say on it. And Lord, I pray that you make it clear to each one of us today what it is you want us to understand through opening our hearts and our minds to receiving your word. And we ask this through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. So last week, Richard Church shared some insights uh, with us with respect to uh, rejection as part of our series that we've been looking at over the last few weeks on identity thieves and identity theft. Actually, I have to say I was a little bit concerned uh, that Richard might actually steal some of my content uh, that I wanted to explore today um, in this area of self-acceptance. Um, but I needn't have worried, as Richard very much focused on rejection from the point of view of the context of outward uh, looking uh, rejection, you know, the rejection of the character of Jesus, rejection of us as Christians, and how society treats us in that way sometimes, and I'm sure we've all seen and felt that uh, in our own lives. Uh, and that's very much about the outward, visible signs of, uh, of rejection. So Richard actually, rather than stealing my content, actually he gave me a great segue into what we need to think about today when we think about the type of identity theft around self-acceptance. So today, the focus shifts to the inward, looking at ourselves and examining what it is inside us that might be stopping us from truly experiencing the joy of being in full union with Christ. And looking at ourselves from the inside can be hard. And it's important to say right up front before we get too far into this message that if anything I share today does trigger you in any way, please don't let those thoughts or emotions fester. You need to act. Please reach out to someone. Don't internalise that. I found from my own experiences in the past that actually internaling, internalising issues around how you view yourself and how you accept yourself and that's whether that's actually in a Christian context or any other context, I would say. Um, doesn't do yourself any good, and it doesn't do anyone around you any good either. So if you are struggling with this topic, please do reach out to Carolyn or Cy or one of the leadership team, to Lorraine, someone you know and trust who's a Christian friend, um, because it's really important that actually you address those triggers and those feelings. And that goes for whether you're sitting here in church or, of course, whether you're online. Um, it's just as easy to reach out online as well these days, of course, isn't it? So, so please do bear that in mind as we explore what can be a very challenging topic. And this is important, isn't it? Because, after all, the theft of self-acceptance is an identity theft that actually can take away the very heart of our identity as a Christian, as a child of God. This faith can rob us of our faith. It can gnaw away at us over time. And equally, actually, it can also arrive very suddenly through an extreme or drastic event in our lives. As I said earlier, this is about inward identity theft. And so by its nature, it's actually less visible than some of the things that Richard was talking about last week when we looked at outward-looking rejection. Having said that, it's often triggered or, or started from outside or outward factors. Uh, and, and some of those things might be our appearance, oh dear, um, our skills and abilities, our financial status, who we know. It's that famous expression, isn't it? It's not what you know, it's who you know. That can be a real problem for us in terms of self-acceptance. Maybe even our Christian beliefs trigger this. And all these types of things are aspects of our life that other people will also look at and they'll comment on them, influencing how we view ourselves. 
perhaps making us feel inadequate. And before we realise it, our identity as a Christian, our faith has actually been impacted and maybe even stolen. And the problem with self-acceptance is not that we tend to look at our achievements, our gifts, our talents, and we measure ourselves against those who we know. Isn't that so true? I've done it loads of times. And it's so easy to take our eyes off God and his plan for us and how he delights in how we use our gifts and talents. But we end up feeling jealous or inferior compared to others around us. Yet Paul talks about this a little bit further on in 2 Corinthians in that letter in chapter 10 uh, when he's addressing this type of point. It's worth actually having a look at, at that chapter. I mean, that's the subject of probably two or three other preachers. Um, but you know, it is worth having a look at 2 Corinthians 10 in that type of context as he looks at the outward and inward aspects of comparing ourselves to others and, and why that's a real danger and what he was trying to get the Corinthian church to stop doing. So one of the first things we need to do when we're trying to combat the theft of self-acceptance is not to focus on that worldly view of ourselves. Uh, In our reading today that Linda shared with us, in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 16, Paul writes, So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Don't look at people from a worldly point of view. Don't look at yourself from a worldly point of view. Look at yourself through God's point of view. Of course, crucially, that's about also how we we engage with others, but most importantly, when we think about self-acceptance, it's about ourselves. A little later, we'll explore what we can do to prevent or address the theft of self-acceptance. But before we do that, let's spend a little bit of time reflecting on what is actually stolen from us when we suffer from that lack of Christian self-acceptance. What is it that we are actually not accepting in ourselves. You will have heard the word reconciliation several times in that reading this morning and clearly that's a key part of it. But I'm going to focus on uh, another word in a moment as well which is equally important in that passage because Paul gives us the answer in 1 Corinthians 5 verses 17 to 19a. He writes, therefore if anyone is in Christ the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Not counting people's sins against them. As Paul put more simply, perhaps, in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So, folks, the bottom line is our struggles with self-acceptance as a Christian can put at risk our ability to accept God's grace, his gift to us of salvation, reconciliation, as Paul puts it, or as Paul also puts it in that passage, that our sins are not counted against us. That is put at risk. The fact we're forgiven is put at risk. So our most basic level of self-acceptance as a Christian can be stolen. The belief that we, as Christian people, have been forgiven and are without sin before God. So before we look at how we know whether or not we're suffering from this theft or not, let's have a look at the gift of forgiveness for a minute or two, because I think it helps us appreciate it all the more, and hopefully it will give us an even greater desire to protect ourselves from this type of theft. Over the years, I've actually come across uh, lots of great examples of forgiveness. Uh, I always remember a documentary I saw many years ago about a Canadian Christian couple who had tragically lost a child, uh, murdered for no particular reason. Um, and after the trial, um, they they had finished, the murderer was starting a life sentence um, and uh, the couple went to see this, uh, this guy in prison and they sat down with him with no guards, no security, no bars, no protection of any description whatsoever and they basically told him that they had forgiven him for what he'd done. I must admit I'm not sure I could have done that. 
great act of forgiveness. When I worked at the Church Missionary Society in Sydney, one day before, just before the end of the genocide in Rwanda, uh, out of the blue, we received a video. Um, yes, they had videos back in those days. Remember them? Um, we received a video of a testimony from one of the bishops in Rwanda. Um, he was a Tutsi guy, uh, and a group of Hutu fighters had arrived at his house one night um, with a very simple purpose and intention, and that was to uh, kill him and all his family. Uh, the bishop answered the door, he spoke to them at the front door, and uh, he, he told the rebels uh, while he was at gunpoint not to worry about the fact that they're about to kill him and his family, because through his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he already knew why they were there and what they were about to do, and he'd already forgiven them for it. And this had such an impact on those rebel fighters that, as he said in his testimony, they became very confused uh, and then they put their weapons down, got into their vehicles and drove off. And, of course, um, subsequently we received the video. as obviously living proof that that, that bishop was still, um, still very much with us at that time. Of course, the greatest act of forgiveness is the one that God... Uh, gave for himself, sacrificing his son on the cross to die for our sins so that we can stand before God without sin or be blameless. As it says in Acts 10, 43, all the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Or as Paul puts it in the passage from today, our sins are not counted against us before God. And that's the heart of what we are accepting as Christians, isn't it? That's the heart of our self-acceptance as Christians. So when you hear that it can be hard to understand why once we've understood about that act of forgiveness, we might struggle with it uh, in, and accept that in our own hearts, that might be because we are struggling to accept we are indeed without sin. Might it be that we don't think we're good enough to receive the gift Maybe we say we don't deserve it. Or maybe other people are telling us we don't deserve it. This is what this identity theft can actually look like. It might also be that we're trying to measure our self-acceptance against those outside of us, against those worldly factors that I, I referred to briefly earlier. Status, money or physical appearance, to name but three. Maybe it's because we place more belief in ourselves and our own abilities rather than relying on the strength and grace of God. Could we be losing sight of this gift and our acceptance of it because of these things? One to reflect on. So if you haven't cottoned on to the message yet, the central point here is that the lack of self-acceptance in Christ can manifest itself from a lack of accepting that we are indeed forgiven. The theft is that we've, been, we've forgotten the good news story of Jesus. We forget or we cannot accept that we are without sin before God. In the same way I've come across some great examples of forgiveness, I've also seen some fantastic uh, examples of accepting forgiveness through Christ. Uh, I'm not sure how that guy in the Canadian prison um, that, that, who killed that couple's child felt when they told him that they'd forgiven him. Uh, I, I, I don't know whether he accepted that. Um, I wonder if, if, even more interestingly, he might have recognised where that act of forgiveness actually came from. It, you know, it, it, maybe he turned to faith in Christ. I don't know. Um, but I'd love to find out. But self-acceptance... Accepting God's grace and forgiveness isn't always easy, is it? Some time ago, I knew somebody uh, who uh, was in one of the care homes my wife Alison worked for when we lived in Sydney. Uh, he was a guy who had ongoing issues and struggles with alcohol. Um, and he really struggled to see, despite his steadfast, manifest and wonderful, unwavering faith, that he was accepted by God because of the struggles he was having with, with alcohol. But self-acceptance and acceptance of God's gifts to us 
can be a thing for us, can't it? Sometimes our situations are not like that or maybe not as extreme as another example that I'd like to share um, because I think it really does show, it's quite extreme, but it does show um, the acceptance and how important that can be in, in our life, particularly in times of extreme stress. I spent a lot of time around 24, uh, 2014 and 2015 following the case of the Bali Nine. Um, some of you may have, have heard of the Bali Nine. Um, they were nine Australians who were caught in 2005 and convicted of heroin smuggling in Indonesia. Um, and if you're aware of the laws in Indonesia, you will be no doubt aware of the consequences of um, that type of action. The two leaders of that group of nine were, were two guys called Andrew Chan and Mutran Sukumanaran. And they were both sentenced to death and they were eventually executed by firing squad in 2015. During their 10 years on death row in very poor prison conditions uh, in Indonesia, they both found faith in Christ uh, and they accepted God's grace. Andrew Chan then studied theology at uh, an Australian Pentecostal theological college and was ordained as a pastor and spent his last years uh, running English church services, uh, pastoring and mentoring other inmates on, on death row. Uh, Mutran actually uh, found after he gave his life to Christ that he had discovered a gifting in painting. Having never done art classes or painted a picture in his life before that time, he used his gift not just to comfort himself uh, through self-portraits, but also he was running art classes for other prisoners on death row with uh, Christian messages and encouraging others to, to paint. He painted many self-portraits that showed clearly his faith and acceptance of God's grace for what he had done. He understood he was forgiven by God, if not by man. And the reason I shared the story of those two guys is to help us remind ourselves that no matter what our life journey has been and how we think of ourselves before God, through faith, we are without sin, just as Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, beginning at verse 19 again, that God does not count our sins against us. Our own self-acceptance is about our understanding of the fact of our ability to embrace without fear or doubt what that we are accepted by God. Paul urges the Corinthian church to accept that fact when he writes in verse, in verse 20 of, of chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, we implore you, he uses the word implore, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He wasn't just asking, he was imploring. And so what's he doing? He's imploring us as Christians, to accept that forgiveness. Of course, we've all got weaknesses and deficiencies, and I've certainly got plenty of them. We all sin, we know that. And some of these things we can change, some of them we struggle with and maybe we can't change. But before God in faith, we will be accepted and we will be forgiven. We will be reconciled. We know that we are created in God's image and through forgiveness, we, his forgiveness, we have newness of life. So just to finish, how do we know and show that we've not lost our identity of self-acceptance in Christ and that we're not suffering from that identity theft? Well, we can start, I guess, by recognising, as Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, that in faith we are Christ's ambassadors. Like the two guys on death row, once they found Christ... They became Christ's ambassadors, using their gifts as a pastor and the other through art. While our situation, of course, isn't likely to be anywhere near as extreme as that, we can show our self-acceptance through our actions as Christ's ambassadors. Using God's gifts in us and his provision to us in our fullness of service to him. Finally, it is worth remembering that uh, this point about self-acceptance is not about worldly stuff, worldly self-esteem, worldly self-belief. 
It's, ba it's not based on image or status. Rather, it's a recognition of God's grace to us through Christ, which gives us a real and true meaning and purpose as we connect with God. So rather than thinking or doing things for ourselves. And if we can achieve that, if we can get to that place where we are acting not on our own or the world's behalf, but through God's grace and recognising that, then not only are we showing that we actually have true self-acceptance before Christ, but I suspect we might even delight in that. Amen.